So if you're taking chemistry or you're teaching chemistry or, or whatever, you probably have seen the phrase something along the lines that covalent bonds involve a sharing of electrons, that ionic bonds involve a transfer of electrons, and that's the big difference between the two. But that leaves open a lot of, a lot of room for interpretation and a lot of room for flaws. And so I want to go through the physics a little bit of what this means and why it's important to say those two things. And really what's missing from this, from this definition, I want to translate this into something that gives you a little more purpose behind what that is. Now to start, one of the really important things behind this is that you need to be accepting of the fact that if you have a positive charge and you have a negative charge, the two things attract each other. And we don't know why they do. Okay, we can say they act via field or or we can describe the mathematics of how much they, they attract each other. There's an equation for that. And you may see that in your class, or you may not. It's usually a little unnecessary. But basically, the more charge you have and the closer they are, the stronger the attraction between them. And then if they're the same sign, then, then of course, the stronger the repulsion would be. But I want to go through why covalent and ionic bonding is different and how positive and negative charges attract. And that's, that's what this is trying to get at, that if you take something that involves covalent bonding, so I have a sugar cube here, and I start to crumble this apart, what am I breaking apart? What am I doing to get that to shatter? Whereas if I take something like sidewalk chalk with ionic bonding, and I, and I rub on that and I get some of this orange chalk under my fingers, what's the difference really between those two that causes them to act differently? And that's a big difference. Now, let's start with the covalent bonding. So with covalent bonding, here's, here's how I like to look at this. I like to start with a really simple molecule, H2. Okay? And hydrogen is a proton and an electron only. Okay? So usually these don't even have electrons. So you have a positive charge and a negative charge, and those two things attract each other. Okay? Most people accept that in an atom you have an electron and a proton, and they, and, they, and they pull towards each other. And we don't know why, but they do. But what happens if you have two? Why would those two things stick together? Okay? And we have to realize this by having two of these atoms near each other, you introduce a lot of things. You introduce some repulsions. The two protons repel each other. Two electrons repel each other. So there's a force of repulsion between those, those two sets of things. But there are also attractive forces. These two things attract each other. These two things attract each other. These two things attract each other. And these two things attract each other. Now, when you're far away, most of those forces are, are really small and are not really important. But as you start to move closer together, something interesting happens. The electrons repelling each other can be minimized if the two electrons are further apart. So what we can have is we can have a case where I end up with the two electrons near the two protons, but not too close to each other, so that I end up with more force of attraction in than I do repulsion away. Okay, and that's going to start to shift, and it's going to start to become more repulsion and more attraction. But, but, the, but the story of this kind of is that, is that I can get a net benefit by having those two electrons in between those two protons. Now those electrons are moving, and they're not static there. But if we were to add up all of the forces involved in that, we could end up with a net force of attraction that pulls these things together and keeps them close, so long as we can keep that distance between these two electrons farther apart. So if the electrons correlate a little bit and how they move around those two protons, what will happen is those things will then stick together. This is what a covalent bond is. Now we describe that as sharing of electrons, which is a very minimalist interpretation of this. These two electrons and these two protons all have these attractions and repulsions between them, and the net of that is that I get these two things to stick together. Okay. And that's how a covalent bond works. Now, I can make more complicated molecules, but that same principle is going to apply that by having these two electrons in between those two, belonging to both, being shared, that I'm going to get a net force of attraction causing that bond, that stickiness. Okay? Now, if we compare that with something like HF. Okay? HF, on the other hand, the fluorine has a lot of protons has nine. The hydrogen has one. And the fluorine doesn't have a lot of electrons repelling. So these two electrons that are being shared are going to shift more towards the fluorine and spend more time near the fluorine than they are near the hydrogen. We're going to polarize this, where I end up with a negative charge more on this side and a positive charge more on that side. And there are some atoms that that polarization is to such an extreme extent that, that the actual molecules end up with a full charge. Okay, and a typical example of that would be something like NaCl. 
So in NaCl, what I have happened is I have a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, probably starting as a molecule here. But let's simplify this down. And this electron goes from here to here. Now, that process is not the actual bond. Unfortunately, we say that an ionic bond involves a transfer of electrons. That's not actually true. The ionic bond is what happens after a transfer of electrons. So you could have transferred electrons a long time ago, but you could have brought this sodium ion that had lost an electron to something else, and this chloride ion that had gained an electron from something else and bring them together. The stickiness is the bond. It's not the transfer of electrons. Okay, but when I'm done, what I end up with is a sodium with a plus charge and a chloride with a minus one charge and negatives and positive charges attract. And so these two things stick together. Now, why are these so different? Okay, this looks very similar, right? It's positive and negative charges attracting. It's positive and negative charges attracting. Well, the big difference is, is that when I'm done with my molecule on this, I have two things sticking together, or I have two things, or maybe three or four, or maybe a few. But with this, when I get a sodium ion and a chloride ion, I can put another chloride ion here, and another one here, and another one there. And what I end up with is I end up with something that looks like this. Okay, and this is much smaller than, of course, we would be looking at in real life. In real life, this would go on much more in this direction, in this direction, and up. And we would have this huge, giant crystal where every sodium ion and every chloride ion are attracted to each other. And so they're kind of in these large groups, okay? What that means is, is that this chalk, everything is kind of bonded to everything, okay? There are ionic bonds between all the ions present in here. It's a giant chain of ionic bonds. Now, if I wanted to break them, if I wanted to melt them, that would be really difficult. Now, now, luckily for us, ionic bonding results in something where if you hit it, you can cause these ions to shift a little bit. So it's still brittle, it still shatters into pieces. But there's a big difference between that and something like sugar. Okay, sugar has, you know, a decent number of atoms in it, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 or so. And they're all bonded in a group. But then that group can't stick to other groups very well. Okay, now I've got it solid here. But it's pretty easy to crumble, and if I started to melt this, it might caramelize, but it would melt at a low temperature for a lot of your molecular compounds, things with covalent bonds in them. Once I'm done with this, I have these two that are bonded together. They have a very strong interaction between them. Okay, but if I bring a second set of molecules, if I have a hydrogen molecule here and another hydrogen here, well, why are those two going to stick together? And so for a lot of those things, they don't stick together very well. Okay, this is going to stay as a gas. Those two are not going to interact very much. Um, and there are lots of other examples of that. If I bring a CO2 molecule and then I have another one, the interaction between those is very small. Okay, as opposed to a salt, you don't see a lot of liquid salts or a lot of gaseous salts. Because these stick together really well as a, as a whole unit. Okay, and that distinction where this is one giant clump with a whole bunch of ionic bonds in it, and, and a covalent bond results in things that, that typically don't form clumps, that it can't stick together very well, that within the molecule sticks, but outside the molecule doesn't work as well. That's a big difference. And so, and so we can see properties of chemicals that are very different by looking at the internal structure of how, how those pieces are sticking together. So when we go back, when your teacher tells you that covalent bonding involves sharing of electrons, what they're telling you is that the mechanism that these things stick leads to a group that's tiny, and then the groups won't stick together. Whereas an ionic bond, I end up with a large group that's all stuck together. And that difference there is very important, the difference between an ionic compound and a covalent compound. We can look at why these dissolve in water better based on that. We can look at why their melting points are higher. Um, and we can even go through and do higher level applications of that. Okay? So that's what your teacher is trying to get you to understand when they're telling you that phrase. Okay?